Jonah is a prophet. If I say Jonah, you say whale, and we miss the point of the story, don't we? We start wondering how you live in a whale for three days, how you do these different things. And to be honest, I've never been eaten by a whale. I feel fortunate for that, but I can't answer those questions. Here's the deal. I believe Scripture intends to teach us something beyond the story of a large fish having a man dinner. I think Scripture intends to teach us something on forgiveness, on God's faithfulness, and God's ever-seeking heart for the people he loves. So last week we talked about Jonah, and when God said, go to that great city, Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire, Sennacherib, Ashurbanipal, the great hated kings of the ancient world. These guys were ruthless. Remember last week I said they would take the generals um, and the and the warriors who fought against them, and they would impale them on spikes like kebabs. On the way into Nineveh, you would pass through a horrifying parade of remembrance, of this is what happens to people who oppose us. Judea, um, the northern tribes of Israel, they would have hated Assyria because Assyria besieged and laid waste to the northern kingdom of Israel. They encircled and, and almost overtook Jerusalem at one point. But in 722 BC, the, the northern 10 tribes of Israel were wiped out and hauled off into exile. And um, there are stories that take place in this of one of the kings whose sons were before him and the, the king of Assyria had the boys executed in front of his father, in front of their father, and then they he gouged out his eyes. So the last memory he had was of his sons being killed by a king greater than him. Jonah hated Assyria, but God didn't. God still loved those who bore his image, even if they were broken lives. And that's important for you and I. So Jonah ran away. Jonah ran away, and we're going to pick up the story today in chapter 1, verse 4, and then we're going to read through chapter through to get, uh, chapter 2 together, and we're, we're really discussing when there's a man, a prophet of God, who flees, but there's also a God who seeks, and we need to remember and understand the seeking nature of God. Okay, and nothing about this should be seen in the, in the isolated context of Jonah and the whale. This should be seen on a broad scripture basis. There are elements in Jonah that speak to the biblical narrative of what God's doing and what God intends to do in this world, and we need to pick up on it. Here's one of the cool things or three of the cool things that go on in this story. First of all, there are Easter eggs hidden in Jonah that will come fully to light in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ spoke about his nature and relationship to the book of Jonah when he says he's going to give the sign of Jonah. And really the first thing we see is Jonah goes into the belly of the whale for three days. He says he swam or he was down at the root of the mountains. Who else went into a tomb for three days and came out of the tomb to bring life to the godless, right? So we're like, oh, there's a little bit of Jesus going on there, right? This isn't just some Old Testament prophet in 722. No, no, 720 years later, we see Jesus kind of living into this. So we see that Jesus uh, spends three days in the ground just as Jonah spent three days in the belly of the whale. Jesus was faithful to do what God called him to do, and Jonah was not. But there's this kind of parallel going on. There's another thing that happens in this where we find Jonah is asleep in the boat. And um, this is crazy because if you remember when Jesus is on the Sea of Galilee and the boat's being swamped and the disciples run to him and they wake him up and they're like, don't you care? How can you sleep right now? We're going to die. Really? The nice, calm guys, right? The people who really believe. You're going to die. It's over. Wake up. And Jesus is cashed out. I want you to listen for some of this that goes on. In this story, as we read it today, there's, there's this asleep in the boat thing. And finally, there's the reality of the casting of lots. It's, it's an ancient tra tradition that we don't really carry on. But the casting of lots was a way to um, figure out, it's like throwing dice for things. And in the moment of judgment in Jesus' life, when Jesus hung on the cross, they cast lots for his clothing. They cast lots for his clothing in the moment of judgment. I want you to pay attention with me to the Easter egg within the story of Jonah 
when the moment of judgment comes and what takes place. That being said, we're jumping into the text. You can follow along as I read here. Jonah chapter 1 verse 4. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. You know it's bad when the sailors get scared, right? When you're on an airplane and there's a little turbulence, you're like, I'm afraid, and the stewardesses and stewards are fine, but all of a sudden when they sit down and buckle up, you're like, we're all going to die. Like, you get nervous. When the sailors get afraid, you, you should be afraid too. So, um, they called out to their own gods, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up, call on your God. Maybe he'll take notice of us so that we don't perish. Then the sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah, and they asked him, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? And from what people are you? Jonah replies a very simple sentence in Hebrew. He says, Ivri Anohi, which means I am an Israelite. And then they really freak out. He has this, this thing where he just says, this is who I am. And they know who he's speaking of. I am a Hebrew, he says. I worship the Lord, the God of the, of the heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified him. And they ask, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. And they ask him, what should we do with you should, to make the sea calm down for us? Jonah replies, pick me up and throw me into the sea, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. They cried out to the Lord, please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. I just want you to get this picture with me. They throw him into the sea, and it goes calm. Where's Jonah? He's like outside the boat. Hey, you probably shouldn't pick me up. I know, it's weird, right? So they're watching this. I mean, we like to sanitize scripture, but he's probably nearby. And like, we could take him out. Oh, we won't touch him, right? You think about this. They can probably see him. But then the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. Again, they can probably see him. They had to be like, ooh, he got eaten. Oh, I'm so glad I'm not him, right? Think about what they're seeing and the magnitude of this. The seas go calm. And then, that's a whale sound. And Jonah disappears. And they're like, let's just go home, right? They just want out of this. The Lord provides a large fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God, and he said, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All of your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight. Yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought me and my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah on the dry land. Guys, look at the big whale, and bleh, huh, 
It's been a dude up. There's a, he's all bleached. I mean, why do we always try to ruin scripture by making it so kind of happy? Imagine the sight. Imagine the sight when the big whale comes up and just goes, oh, something's wrong. You know, when you get sick and you're like, God, please, anything but this. And the whale had to be like, he's been talking to you for three days. My food has been making sounds in me. I need it out. He pulls up and he, or he coughs him up. Jonah gets out, wrapped in seaweed, and had to think, no way. No way. I made it. I made it in the heart of the sea. God heard me. When I was lost forever, God heard me. And I don't, they don't say where he got coughed up, but I wonder if he was in a place where he's like, all right, I know where I am. And he had to take off walking to be obedient to what the Lord called him to do. He had to be obedient to what the Lord called him to do. The Lord commanded the fish and it vomited him out. It spit him back out into the same place where he was when he began to run away from the Lord. The Lord sought and was seeking Jonah. And I think we need to unpack the fact that Jonah has a bit of a selective memory in this whole process. Remember last week we talked that Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh because he knows the Lord is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. And he relents from sending calamity. He doesn't want God to relent from destroying Nineveh, but he still goes and runs away. Why? Why? Because Jonah doesn't want them forgiven. So he runs away. But God wants to restore something with the, the people of Nineveh. And we don't know why. They were a wicked, brutal people. But God still loves them. And that means there's hope for you and hope for me. Because Jonah has his selective memory where he remembers the goodness of God towards those. He knows God's law, slow to anger. But the reality is Jonah also knows what God does to those in Israel who do not obey the Lord's commands. Jonah remembers well that God sends punishment on the people of Israel when they go and worship other gods, when they willfully disobey. Have you ever willfully disobeyed your parents when you were young? Anybody? Anybody? Yeah. You know, when you do something stupid, like, you know, you just aren't paying attention and you knock a bunch of stuff over in the grocery store, your mom's like, come on. And you're like, I'm sorry, I wasn't looking at the green beans. And there's green beans everywhere. And you're like, and your mom's just like, come on, before the manager comes. And you go and you check out, right? That's an accident. But when your mom says, don't touch the green beans, and you say to your brother, bet you I can pull this can out, nothing will fall. <laughs> sorry. And your mom's like, did you do that on purpose? No. And there's willful disobedience. Who got their backyard shined by their parents for doing something like that? Yeah, right? Like, it, yeah, I'm telling you, I got mine spit polished a few times for things like that. Willful disobedience. We understand that when we willfully choose against God, that there are consequences. And Jonah has this selective memory. He thinks God is going to wipe him out. He thinks God has wiped him out. He has caused a storm. He has had him thrown into the waters. Life is rough, and then on top of it, he gets eaten, and he's got to think, this is my judgment. But at some point in thinking of his judgment, he begins to talk to God from the heart of the ocean, in the belly of the beast, down deep in the waters, and he begins to speak to God in this kind of redemptive language that he will yet again praise God. He doesn't see his life is over. He sees something redeemable in it. He has this selective memory that thinks he's going to be punished. But maybe it's not just punishment. Maybe God's not so into punishment as he is getting our attention. Maybe God really wanted Jonah's attention. And Jonah brought calamity on sailors, on their cargo, on the businesses affiliated with that cargo, and then eventually on to himself to get alone and away from himself. And God got him to the heart of the ocean and got his attention. Jonah has this selective memory, but I believe this. Jonah also forgot something critical. Jonah forgot that God loved him. 
we see in the person of Jesus that God has a heart for those who run away. Remember last week we talked about the prodigal son who, who ran away from his father. It's a story Jesus taught. He ran away from his father. He took part of his inheritance and squandered it. And the father longed for his son to come back, didn't he? He longed for his son to come back. Jesus is revealing something of God's heart in that. It says that if you are messed up and you have willfully run away, don't hide from God. Come out, come home to God. Come home to God. We see Jesus teach again when the shepherd has a hundred sheep and one gets lost. Jesus says the good shepherd leaves the 99 to find the one who wandered off and got lost. Why is Jesus saying these things? And why does it echo back to Jonah? Because Jonah forgot that God loved him in spite of himself. And I believe the church quite often feels like the wrath of God is going to descend on them if we disobey. And there will be consequences to our sin and our actions. There's just consequences. You can't unbreak the egg, so to speak. But the fact is God loves us. And God's seeking us, not to find us and then put the paddle to us. I remember when I was little, my mom would shop at a store called Keith O'Brien's. I don't know why we dressed in Irish clothes, but we did. And we would go to this store, and one time, I went to a mannequin. I was a shifty kid. I apologize. But I went to a mannequin, and I got under its dress, and I stood there. And I was like, (laughs) And my mom turns around, she's like, Eric, Eric. And I was like, I thought it was awesome. And then her voice kind of went up an octave. Eric? Eric? Oh, my gosh, where did he go? And then I'm like, well, I'm not coming out now. (laughs) Now she's ticked. Eric? Eric. And all of a sudden over the microphone, would Eric Fulgers please come up to the service desk? And I was like, no. (laughs) No, she's going to wail on me when she finds me. Not because my mom didn't like, I would have gotten a spanking. She wouldn't like hit me on the head or anything, but she would have tattooed my behind. And, um, and I was like, no, no. And then somebody noticed that there was a mannequin with four legs. I think we found Eric. And it wasn't he anymore. It's like, oh, God, please don't find me. I've made a mistake. I wanted to stay lost. The thing that blows my mind is when my mom found me, she was like, oh, and she hugged me. And she was so sweet until we got to the car. <laughs> and, and, it's, and it's fair. I'm a parent now. I'm a parent. Like your kids build like you're in Myers and they build like a toilet paper fort while you're shopping for paper towels. You turn around like, where'd they go? And they're making a cave. And you're like, I lost all of them. I didn't just lose one. It's terrible. It's a horrifying experience. And if you've ever like misplaced a child, you feel terribly guilty about it. And you're afraid. But then you also are like, you, you little hider, like you, and you make up names for him because you're super angry, right? We think God's just going to be like, mm, what are you doing? Let's not forget that God is all-seeing and all-knowing. He doesn't lose us. We run as far as we can, but let's jump back and just talk for a brief minute about how one of the symbols that God loves us is. Water plays a big part in the Scriptures, It's often referred to as chaos. Before the creation, God's spirit hovered over the waters of the chaos. When God's people left Egypt, they walked through the waters of the Red Sea. When God started the redemptive process with his people in Egypt, they put Moses in a basket into the waters. When Jesus was baptized, he was put into the waters. When God started seeking Jonah, he put him into the waters. And what does the covenant of baptism mean? For us, it means this, that God will never leave you, and he will never let you go. You can run as far as you want, but his ever-searching eye and his ever-loving heart will bring home those who he loves. God loves those whom he puts into the waters. And sometimes it feels like discipline, but most often it's a reminder of the covenant of God with his people. It feels like chaos because of our own actions, but the heart of God says that he puts into the waters those who he loves. And we see this in the story of Jonah. Jonah had forgotten God loved him. 
Jonah couldn't see the redemptive thing going on. He was in the storm of his life. He was wondering what would happen. He was overwhelmed with his guilt, with his shame, and the exhaustion of what he had done. And here's the reality. God is a good father. If you have a child and they came up to you and they said, I've made a decision. First of all, just sit down. It's going to be awesome when they make decisions like this. Like, I've decided my life is only Mountain Dew and Twinkies. As a parent, you'd be like, all right, you get chicken and broccoli and you're going to eat only that until you kind of clean some things up. You're not going to dictate and harm yourself by eating basically plastic turned into food. I'm not doing that to you. I'm a better parent than that. I love you enough to disappoint you. I love you enough to be hated by you. I love you enough to make sure I nourish a long life in you. I'm not letting you live according to your standards. A good parent sets boundaries and is willing to discipline when things go sideways. But they don't discipline because they're mad at you. My mom didn't discipline me because she was mad at me. My dad didn't discipline me because they were mad at me. They disciplined me to form character in me, to quit hiding in the wrong places, to quit making bad choices. Do we see what God's heart is doing in this? He's not crushing Jonah. He's getting the attention of one whom he loves, who he intends to use as a tool for salvation. We need to recognize that Jonah forgot that God didn't just love Nineveh. He loved him, even though he ran. And I think we Christians need to remember that God doesn't just love the world beyond these, bo- these walls. He loves you no matter how far you've run, no matter what you've done. You are not beyond redemption. You are not beyond the love of your heavenly Father. So I think the question comes back, where have we willfully wandered away from God? Where have we gone and hidden so that we don't get found by God, so that we can just be ourselves and we have this secret life? I want to tell you something. According to Psalm 139, there is no place that we can hide that God does not dwell. If we go to the depths of hell, he, he would come and find us there. If we're in the heights of heaven, he would find us there. If you're out in Nepal and you've lost your Sherpa and you're alone on K2, he's there. God is ever seeking, ever present, never loving. Where have you tried to wander that you think you can get away from God? Because you can't. He loves you and he desires you. But there are some effects to what we've done that help us kind of realize what Jonah was doing kind of juxtaposed with what Jesus did. Remember when Jesus was asleep in the boat? We talked about that. And the disciples were like, we're dying, we're dying. I'm in so much trouble. Wake up. What does Jesus say back to him? It's fine. And he stands up and he rebukes the wind and waves and everything goes calm. Why was Jesus asleep? Because he was Lord and master of the storm that raged around him. Why did Jonah go to sleep? Have you ever been in an overwhelming situation where life is just bearing down on you and you can't really stay awake? You just get really groggy and you start shutting down. Have you ever been so exhausted that you kind of start nodding off against your own will. Anybody else ever have that? If you're a mother in this room, you're like, yeah, they're called babies. Like that's how it feels, right? You just are exhausted. You're so tired, your face hurts. But sometimes there is an exhaustion that comes with fleeing from God. The guilt, the shame, and the overwhelming burden of who you're not being Kind of just, oh, I can't deal with this. And I would propose to you that God seeks us even while we sleep and hide from him. Jonah is dead asleep on the bottom of a ship. And he's either doing it because he's in denial of his circumstances or he's exhausted from running from God. And today, I don't want to relieve the tension for you. We're going to apply this to our lives, but I don't want to relieve the tension. I want you to go away from this place and wrestle with this reality. Because I would guess you, like me, are on a run from God in some areas. And it's time for the church to wake up and face the storms we've created in our own life. And recognize we haven't obeyed God when he spoke very clearly to us. So we are going to apply it in a simple way. It's time to face the storm. It's time for us to face the storms we've created, but I want to face it in a certain context. The Lord Jesus Christ says these words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
no one comes to the Father except through me. Those are the words of Jesus. So when people say God's a mountain and there's many ways up, not according to Jesus. Because he is the way. He is the truth and he is the life. And the only way to the Father is through him. So when Jesus says that, we have something to face the storm with. So here's what I want to do today. I want to invite you to face the storms, to wake up for maybe a spiritual slumber where you've ignored God for too long and you've been okay with it and life has gone on, but God is saying, wake up. I have a purpose for your life and it's more than 60 hours a week at a job, ignoring your family, ignoring your spouse. Wake up. It's more than Pinterest. It's more than social media. It's more than the next BuzzFeed article. Wake up. It's more than Michigan beating Michigan State or vice versa. It's more. There's purpose in this life. Wake up. Wake up and face the storms around us. So here's how we do it. If you're in denial of the storms in your life, if you're like, you know what? I don't think the storm's that bad. Here's what I'd like to encourage you to do. Wake up and go look. Wake up and go look. Just be like, you know what? I'm going to face what's going on in my life, whatever the storms may be. It could be that your marriage is on the rocks. It could be that your kids hate you because you're an abusive, loud, cruel voice in their life. It could be that your coworkers uh, dread you and they're looking for a way to get rid of you because you will not stop being a tyrant. I don't know what it is, but there are storms brewing in our lives that we need to stop being in denial about, and we need to stand up and face the storm. But let's do it like this. Since Jesus says that he is the truth, the way, and the truth, let's, instead of being in denial, if you're in denial, let him be your truth. Let him be truth. There's no denial when you face truth. So if you're in denial of it, just stand up and ask God. Speak truth to me. And if you want to know where to find truth, it's in the word of God. This is how he speaks to his church most often. Get into the word of God. Spend some time in the gospels and see if you find yourself in any of the people in the story. See if you find your story matching up. Stop living in denial that there's a storm raging around because of our own denials and actions of Christ. And wake up and face the storms around us and hold on to the fact of this, that if you're in denial, you turn to the one who is the truth, and that is Jesus Christ. The second thing is this, if you're exhausted, is anybody else here just kind of tired? Because I get tired sometimes. I feel like, man, when is the grind going to let up? When, is things, when are things just going to get easier and you feel exhausted? If you are exhausted with your own life, I want to tell you something. Jesus is the truth, but he's also the life that you're seeking. So if you're exhausted from running from God and hiding in your sin, I want to invite you to the life that you're actually seeking. And it's found only in the person of Jesus Christ. So over this next two weeks, you need, you must sit with this and face the storms and also admit you're probably just beat dog tired from running a rat race that had no point. But in Christ, we find the truth that though it may sting, it will bring life to us. And in Christ, we find the rest and the peace because he is the life we seek. But the reality we face is this. Until the church wakes up and faces the storms in its personal and corporate life, we will continue to flounder in the chaotic waters of this world. And I don't think there's much more time for the church to flounder. I think it's time to wake up, head to the top deck, and see what's going on in our personal lives, in our corporate life, and then start to live according to what Jesus Christ has called us to be. Not according to our comfort, not according to our own desires, but live according to what Christ has called us to be. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, today we we find ourselves longing for truth, Uh, no longer seeking an easy pass into whatever's next, God. But we long for truth. And Lord, if it's the same kind of story as Jonah where we find ourselves woken up to face the storm of life, may your truth speak to us. And may we not be in denial of it. Lord, would you just speak? Would you spend time with us speaking? Lord, would you put us 
back into the waters and remind us that as baptized people, we are promised that you'll never leave us and never let us go. May we hold on to that truth. And God, we ask that if we are exhausted, that in you we would find rest, that we would stop running and we would turn and just stand and receive from you the hope, the long-suffering, the patience, and the love of our Heavenly Father. Lord, we know we can't receive it until we stop running, until we stop denying. So we ask, challenge us, God, by just being present in our life. And may our lives, from maybe some dark places, say a prayer much like Jonah did, that once again, we will see the Lord's temple, and we will be his people in service of his kingdom. God, give us such vision and give us such courage as we turn to face the realities of the storms around us, both personally and corporately. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Friends, this is a teaching today that's challenging you into something that's going to be desperately uncomfortable. You're going to see friends and family members kind of like Jonah overboard in the waters of their own kind of the storms of life, and they have to face that. Don't relieve the tension. Let them deal with God and let God deal with them remembering that he loves you and that your life is supposed to tell a redemptive story. And it starts with you. So I'm going to remind you again, don't live in denial that the storms are raging around you. I don't know if it's alcohol. I don't know what it is in your life that holds on to you and has created a storm. But I want to invite you, wake up. Don't live in denial. Seek the one who has truth. Wake up, even if you're exhausted, and turn to the one who has the life you are called to live in. Wake up, church. Our time is here to do the work that we are called to do with God so that our lives may be a living testimony to his grace, his goodness, his love, compassion, and mercy. But before that happens, the church must wake up. My friends, as you face this coming week, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. May you experience the peace of Christ in the storms that you're surrounded by. May the peace of Christ be your identifying badge. In the name of Christ, you are dismissed.